When looking for the king of podcasts, you're at the wrong channel. Well, excuse me! Looking for good ideas for life? You're far from good hands. Hey, bud, what's your problem? If you think the listener is always right, you're far from the right place. Out of order! Even in the future, nothing works! Hosted by a Northeasterner by birth, but a rebel by choice. Are you threatening me? If you want a host that floats between love and madness, and we know the night is always gonna be here anyway. Thinking of you's working up my appetite, looking forward to a little afternoon delight. Then play on and listen to Crazy Train Radio. All right, guys, uh, listen to the blues riff and B. Watch me for the changes and try and keep up, okay? Warning, creators of this game do understand the subject matter may be offensive to some, but they do honor the families and people that have been affected by these real life tragedies that these individuals have caused. Wanna play a game? Oh yeah! Lover of true crime? Yes, yes, yes. Well, we got an interesting game for you to check out. Wow. With the mashup of influences such as horror movies, collecting cards, and RPGs. What? Led to giving birth to an incredible creation of this game. Killers, the card game. You are all my children now. This game is a collectible trading card game featuring some of the most infamous killers with tidbits of trivia on the back of each card to help you learn some insight to each criminal. Who the hell are you? Let's not forget, during the game, cops will be chasing you and these criminals. I'm a cop, you idiot! However, check out their website listed through all social media today, which can be found under Killers, the card game. Am I on the internet? I want to play a game. Hey, this is Robert Galinsky, worldwide coach of everybody. You're listening to Crazy Train Radio. Enjoy. Hey folks, it's your least favorite host in the podcast world, Croc, Jonathan Steele. Boy, do we have a good one for you today. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, this next guest is a playwright, actor, poet, coach, entrepreneur, father, and many other things. As of the recording here on 10-3, for at least another five days, he is currently working with a friend and previous show guest, Lynn Shea, with her one-woman show, Tripping on Life, that's off Broadway and NYC. Let's welcome Robert Galinsky. How you doing, sir? Great. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Of course. So we'll start there. We don't want to ruin the whole show because I'm sure Lynn reached out the same night that I was there and saying she wants to do a review post-show. So I'm going to respect that. But how did you get involved with the project as a director? And I've heard this story from her, but how did you, what's your uh, take on that? Sure. Um, am I allowed to swear on the show? You could say whatever the fuck you want. Shut up, fat boy. All right, don't call me fat, you fucking 
me, Jew. Eric, did you just say the F word? All right, thank you. Um, I did a one-person show that I wrote and produced called Everything in New York Goes Bang. And I did that in Los Angeles last November. Lynn came to that show um, because a, a mutual friend invited her. And um, she came up to me after the show and said, you lit a fucking fire. <laughs> you lit a fucking fire. I said, what's going on? She said, I want you to direct my one woman show. I've got 10 pages written. I wrote it 12 years ago. I want you to direct it. I said, send it to me. Let me look at it. And she sent it that night. And I looked at it the next day and I thought it was fabulous. And it was a great beginning. I called her back. I said, keep writing, keep writing, do nothing but keep writing and let's do this. So that was November, only 11 months ago when we started and we spent four months going back and forth on Zoom, developing it, editing it, rewriting it, and then um, set some dates and did the show in Los Angeles. And in, uh, I think it was June, June, May of last year. Yeah. And uh, that was a five show run as well out in LA, yes. correct? Yes. That was a, we had a four show run planned and then we got we won a producer's award and that in that with that award we were uh, given an encore performance at the theater nice well just to set the tone because we want people to be able to check out the show if they have the opportunity while it's sure. still in new york city it's set in the 60s in a time of political outrage and unrest maybe some drug use rumor has it of that time period yep uh there was the show is a chronicle of her personal journey and had some serious life changing moments in 68. The music it gives a psychedelic feel to it through the whole production. So between L.A. and New York, what's the response been? Because I enjoyed it the night I saw it. Yeah, the response has been amazing. People um, people say three things. One, people laugh. They think it's there's a lot of funny stuff in there. Um, her family relationships, introductions with people, a few scenes in there, and people um, cry. People have been shocked at the moments that Lynn brings to it, where we leave the comedy and we get into a sober reality, and um, it's cathartic. I have seen audiences. I I stand by the door on the way out of every show to thank every person who's shown up, and the comments. I get are amazing, exhilarating. You got me there. That was surprising. Oh my goodness. I didn't know that was going to happen. People's eyes are wet and red. So people leave laughing. People leave somber, reflecting on their own lives. And then people leave saying, when is it going to be made into a film or a Netflix special? That's the other thing I keep hearing. Do you think there is a possibility of that, a film or Netflix or a streaming episode there? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, might, might, when I put my producer's cap on, this is a one-woman show that should be on a Netflix or an HBO or an Apple. Um, they put up enough one-hour specials of comedians that uh, you know are doing really beautiful um, venues uh, in these specials, and these are you know hour-long or forty-five-minute-long stand-up comedy routines that are just being done in basements, basement comedy clubs. So the, I think that we have a Hollywood horror icon who's turning mm -hmm. eight in two weeks, who's giving us a, a, a intense story about a moment in her life in 1968. And then also giving us a time capsule of that, uh, that era. Also working with the original lighting artist from that era, Josh White, who created Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin's lighting in light shows. Um, so you got a whole bunch of really cool elements that one not only make this a really powerful one woman show that would be great on a Netflix, but also uh, a time capsule. You know, it's a it's a piece of uh, it's an artifact from the late 60s um, storytelling that I think would also serve people just simply as as that as an artifact. Um We've done all the work. We've done all the writing, the rewriting. We've tested it in front of audiences. It works. People are blown away. So to me, it's a Netflix HBO special. And all that means is just upping the production value behind everything that we've already done. And before we go more in depth with you, how would you would your producers cap on? 
what changes would you do with the show in its current form if that opportunity arose? The only changes I see would be starting to er- interpret the show uh, with multi-camera, multi-camera direction to enhance the drama and the comedy between the, you know, the editing of multi-cameras. And then the other thing would be having some scenic and lighting designers come in uh, to create a really cool set with us. And that again is cinema, te- cinema, cinematographic. Um, so right now it's a theatrical experience. This to me would be a theatrical and cinematic experience. Um, and then we'd also be able to take what music, original music that Lee Landy has created, integrate that more. And also the visual tech and uh, psychedelics that Josh White has. So it's a, it's to me, it's just a, it's a great next step to, to um, throw a ton of simple, but effective production values behind what we've already got. Awesome. So it's tripping on life.com for the website. If you want to read more about it, tripping on uh, life, tripping on life, the play.com. Thank you. No problem. So you spent a lot of time coaching and public speaking and things like that. And I found it interesting doing some reading. You spent some time speaking at Oxford University in April. Yeah. So what was that like for you? Uh, it was amazing. I've never been to Oxford before. It's it's absolutely gorgeous. It's beautiful, scenic. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, and speaking in front of all of these uh, intellectuals was really, really uh, exciting, especially because my style is to shake it up a little bit and add some performance to it. Um, so I basically looked out at this audience of uh, of teachers and librarians. It was a it was a literary summit, and um, I got excited to take my bits of performance. I did I did a poem in the middle of it. Uh, I told some stories about my work with teenagers at Rikers Island Jail and and um, also the incarcerated individuals at Sing Sing Prison and seven other jails and prisons around the state. So it was cool. I was bringing in a different element. Most of the folks there were uh, talking from, again, an academic point of view, numbers and statistics and working with populations that might be on the fringe, but none uh, as traumatized as our incarcerated youth. Well, with that being said, you cover so many different areas with the coaching, whether it be one-on-one or group. The military, incarcerated youth and adults, TED Talks, so many things. So how do you change what you are teaching or trying to express pending on the group you are focusing on? Like you said, you're dealing with, like Oxford is the articulate folks or the incarcerated youth. You know, your audience is vast and wide. How do you focus on what you want to try to get across? That's a great question because the material doesn't change. Uh, the what I teach does not change. What te- what changes is what you point out, which is maybe the approach. But all the information that I have, uh, it does not change. I've had the CEO of Chase Bank on his knees pretending he was a tree. And later that day, I was up in Harlem at a Baptist church doing the same thing with uh, young children. The following day, I was out in the Poconos at a nudist colony, you know, so it doesn't matter who I'm uh, working with. I'm basically it's the it's the principles that are solid and have been tested and have been things I've learned over the past 30 years and developed that I bring to these people to the different populations. So it's it's really fun because when I go into the Rikers Island, work with these these quote unquote tough guys and girls, um, you know, I, I obviously come in a little bit looser, uh, but it's really not too, too much different. I just have to be, I have to listen in a different way. That's the, one of the big things. With that being said, i mentioned in the intro that you've done acting and producing and directing and just a vast thing, the public speaking for the different groups. Is there a preference that you have, whether it's writing, performing, or producing, directing? 
I love them all. Uh, it's hard to say. So I really love them all. I, I like directing right now, like working with Lynn on this show has been super cool and fun. Uh, I love it. It's a little less stressful. It's a different type of stress than performing. The other thing is performing your own work is also a lot different than performing somebody else's work. When I'm performing my own work, not only do I have my uh, performance to think about, but I've got the words that those are my words. Those are my intentions, my feelings. So there's a whole nother level of responsibility to carry on my back when I'm doing my own work. When I'm doing somebody else's work, it's truly just interpretation of those words and there's no um, there's no other connection to them other than I'm channeling and interpreting somebody else. So I do love directing. I like watching, in this case, Lynn come up with things that are are super cool, interesting, or bizarre, or worthless, and being the rebounder for her to to bounce it off of. And she's brilliant. She's an amazing artist. Uh, I've devoted the past six months of my life to to her work. Uh, because I just believe in her. She's inspiring to me. And this is just a, a phenomenal story that she tells and she tells it in such a unique way. So I would have to say directing is really the exciting part for me right now. Well, and it was funny, two things with that. I heard you mention last week there to a couple of young uh, females in the holding room about Lynn's training with Lee Strasberg. Yeah. So that and with what you were just answering, there's different approaches to how people take a product, whether it's a play, one woman show, movie, TV, whatever it is, yep. whether it's your own words or somebody else's words. What is your approach in terms of, because you have hands in different pots. Mm -hmm. So what is your take? Is the word gospel on a script or you one that is a little more flexible and getting the message across? What do you mean by what do you mean by gospel? There are some people like writers and directors do what's on the page. Do you know what I mean? Script wise, yeah. where yeah. someone who performs or whatever would say, well, we can get that same message across, but why don't we try word it this way? Or, you know, I mean, try to play with what's on the page yeah. if that makes sense yeah uh, you got to have that flexibility i mean I, I i'm a i'm a writer myself so i love it when i go in and i'm like every word perfectly exactly the way i wrote it please uh and i think there are certain projects that need that discipline and every project should start with that discipline but i've learned that once the actors get their teeth into something and they start to own it and start to create more for the character some of that language will be new language that will come out of the actor and not every actor is great at improvising uh so that a lot of that language is garbage but i think that the freedom for the actor to improvise is key and in that improvisation we discover new physical actions and we discover new emotional areas and and even dialogue so with lynn I've had it easy, you know, and it's, it, it's difficult work, but it's been easy work because Lynn comes in with ideas and rewrites and we'll look at them and sometimes we're fresh out of the box. They're like, oh, my God, that's great. What a great addition. What a great reinterpretation. And then sometimes we'll look at it and say, well, it's maybe not good because it's going to give this away or it's foreshadowing something that doesn't have any meaning. Um or we're repeating something. So it's been really exciting with her because of her creativity. And also she's, she's a stubborn person because she <laughs> believes, in what, you know, she believes in her work, which is very, very, I respect that. And she and I have developed a relationship that uh, I can cut through layer one of the stubbornness and just, you know, wait that out and then try to get my point across, which I end up doing. And then we, we weigh whether or not we're going to run with it or not. And I do want to say that when Robert says she has stubbornness, he means that in a good way because, you know, that's just someone who has pride in what she does with her work. So, you know, yeah. he's not, he's not dogging her at all. It's just 
her personality lets to go get her that Detroit gal that she is. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So the other two things that I want to bring up, and I found it interesting. First off was there was a program you were involved with. I don't know if it's still active, is Literacy for Incarcerated Teens. So what is that exactly? Literacy for Incarcerated Teens is a small nonprofit that is run by a group of retired librarians. And their goal is to make sure that uh, teenagers, a, a often forgotten population in prisons and jails, has books, has access to reading, has access to literature, because re the recidivism rate for uh, any incarcerated individual is about 97% when they can't read or when they're not reading. So that's what the organization does. I work with them. I create workshops with different uh, prisons and jails around the state and facilitate these workshops with young people. And they run the gamut from us writing screenplays to poetry, to stage plays, to us uh, watching movies and talking about the writing and talking about what's going on in the films and the messaging. And most of the time I will adapt what I'm doing to fit the room. Not the information again, but the approach. And so it can vary. If we've got a really group of engaged kids that want to write, then we'll write. We'll put together a little chapbook and publish it. Um, I have one student who I said, get in touch with me when you get out. She did. And we spent a year working on a TED talk and she ended up landing a TEDx talk that talked about her experience in jail. So wide gamut, Jonathan, and just, um, just a lot of uh, work around words and understanding words and their power. Interesting. And I find myself going down rabbit holes with TED Talks often. I don't know why, but it's fascinating when you, and it's all different subjects. So if you have an opportunity to watch them, it's pretty enlightening. But the other thing I wanted to bring up is you have or had the reality TV school, yep. which it was funny. I was watching some news clippings on that whole new technology called YouTube, which was quite interesting. Uh -huh. so, yeah. So what made you go that route for the reality t TV school, but also what about reality TV would people be surprised about from what you know, doing what you do? Um, well, basically the, the reality TV to me fits into what I do because I coach people on how to keep the interest of an audience and how to communicate their message clearly. And to me, that's what the best reality television characters are. They're truthful, they're raw, they are effective with their communication and economical with it. And so that's what I do with reality school. I, it's, and it started a while ago. Um, probably over, well, 12 years now, basically, uh, you know, I saw an opportunity. I saw, I had somebody reach out to me for coaching and said, look, I'm going to be on a reality TV show. Can you coach me? And I said, sure. Cause my philosophy is say yes to everything. <laughs> and so I hung up the phone and said, what the hell am I going to do with this guy? And ran some of my exercises that I do with actors to this guy. And I realized, oh, this works. We're getting a truthful character out of him. We're getting authenticity out of him. He's getting clarity in telling his story. And that's going to make him the most compelling person on, on screen. And he went on this show called Animal Planet. His name's Jorge Bendersky. Uh, he went on Animal Planet. Groomer has it. Dog groomers competing. First season, he finished in the top three. And it launched a career for him as a spokesperson, as an ad, a pitch man. Uh, and that's when I said, wow, I think I'll open the school because there's going to be tons of people who want to be on reality TV and think what they are supposed to do is be somebody else, is to be a bullshitter. And those people get voted off the island. They get kicked out of the house very quickly. And uh, my goal was to also teach the students how to to preserve their pride and integrity because the producers and editors are really predators. You combine those two words and that's what they are. They're predators and they want to take as much out of your soul as possible and put it on the screen 
in the most uh, orgasmic way, whether it's truthful or not. So a lot of what I do is get people clear about you're going to go through a meat grinder. How do you remain intact while they're grinding the hell out of you? Oh, it's showbiz, baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but and you just said it. But when I asked, started the question there, but that's probably one of the reasons I got a good vibe from you. It's like you say yes to everything. Then you're going when you walk away, you hang up the phone or whatever the email I go. How in the fuck am I going to accomplish that? But right. some, way, some way we find a way to do it. But what is next for you? And if people want to find the coaching, where can they find that? You go to galinskycoaching.com. And uh, galinskycoaching.com is where you find all my work. And what's next for me is uh, to take this piece and get it at, on television as an HBO, Apple, Netflix, Hulu, one hour special. There's, that's the goal. Uh, that's what I'm going to be working on. And simultaneous to that, we are. I have a one-person show myself called The Bench, a homeless love story, which has been booked around the country. And now I'm going back to Atlanta at the beginning of the year, and we're rewriting the stage play into a screenplay with the hopes of turning it into a, a very cool indie film. Have you started the process in talking to not only indie filmmakers for your project, but also the TV side to make a special for Tripping on Life. Well, we're just concentrating on this off-Broadway run right now. We are going to dig into what's the next step once we're done. Uh, we don't want to look too far ahead. We got uh, seven shows left, so we're going to rock those out and then uh, take a breath and then start to talk about, okay, wh what's, the ne what's the next step to get this onto a one hour special. Uh, I also have a little cool little gig coming up that I'm excited about where I've been hired by the Juilliard school to work with, yeah, to work with um, their musicians on presentation. So again, it goes back to, it doesn't matter if it's a, an executive in a C-suite, a gangbanger in Rikers Island or a jazz musician at the Juilliard school. The principles are all the same in terms of how to bring your best to people and to be as clear as you possibly can. Robert Kalinsky, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey there, Friday fans. We know how much you enjoy the movies. Enjoy grabbing your Friday merchandise and interacting with the Friday family, whether it be at conventions or during our particular watch-alongs. Well, when you're looking to get yourself masks, why not check out our friends over at Camp Blood Customs out of New York State and order your specific custom mask from any of the films. All orders are made specifically your needs and wants are. Make sure you find Camp Blood Customs on Facebook, Instagram, and all over social media and order yours today. Hi, I'm Lynn Shea, and you have been listening to Crazy Train Radio. They're not so crazy, though. They're awesome.